Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries. I'm your host, John, and this is the concluding part of my conversation with Johannes about long-form campaigns and talking about our particular campaigns that we're running at the moment as of time of recording and some other stuff that we sort of segued into. So we're going to get straight into that after the music. And we're starting off the conversation in this episode with talking about running different campaigns set in the same campaign world, but in different time periods of the world's history. Now that would be like that, uh, talking about using the same setting and um, playing at different points on the timeline, be real nice to play in the sort of like vast epochs of time before the current campaign's present where the land masses were entirely different yeah. <laughs> and then you know put in because we know now what the current day is we can also then take stuff from there put it back like hundreds of millions of years and you know make the references uh that yeah, way. In, in terms of like the, the past of like the, the campaign wood for smoke and snow you guys like have discovered a fair bit about it you know like the the original mages who like mm-hmm. caused the ice age and they did it to seal this like demonic creature in and stuff like that but everything sort of like far before that is fairly nebulous and like i've got like a little timeline in my notes but like say it's like oh the age of heroes like this is the major theme of this age the age mm-hmm. of the serpent kings this is what happened in this age but beyond that it's sort of fairly nebulous so obviously if we move into the future we, we've got the knock-on effects of what you guys have done which mm-hmm. you can have callbacks which is all nice and cool but things can develop in an interesting different way but like you say in the same way if you go far into the past it's nebulous enough that you know like you can i mean we we know that like oh the world doesn't explode because it's still Mm -hmm. there in the future but Mm -hmm. if you guys like oh yeah we were instrumental in like destroying the main like serpent man temple or whatever it's like well Mm -hmm. that that would have had an effect in the future but it's so remotely distant in the past Mm-hmm. that like the actual d- direct impact on the previous campaign we'd had would have been fairly negligible mm-hmm. so it leaves it quite open for that oh, one one um one of the things i was going to ask uh, about campaigns in terms of like your uh burning world campaign chronicle mm-hmm. of the crowns obviously as we've said we've both been running our campaigns for some time now mm-hmm. how, have you got any ideas or how do you sort of envision like the end point of the current campaign being and just to like carry on from what we've just been talking about do you envision yourself potentially returning to this world or yeah yeah absolutely because we've developed it to such an extent now uh, <clears throat> and um as, as stated we all pitched in yeah, yeah so it's it's our common creation and we've i've especially after we start the game i've done a lot of the development and now burning wheel gives uh, the player characters tools to continue developing the setting as we play and we have done some of that as well but I've, I've put in a whole bunch of stuff since uh, we've invested a lot in this and I like it seems like the players are liking it as well and um, I think there's a lot of value we can squeeze from the setting well, unless Matthew's character destroys the world like I, I suppose that might be a, a, like a, a very. I, I think e- even if, <laughs> I mean, hopefully that that doesn't happen. But uh, <laughs> even if that did happen as well, I think you you could still sort of carry on the world because, yeah. like, you know, when people say like, "Oh, so and so destroyed the world," they very rarely mean like, "Oh, they atomized the planet and like, yeah, reduced yeah, the, it the, to the, dust." Yeah, the the planet's core cracked and now it cools yeah. and and all life dies. No. So you, you think about like Lord of the Rings, where like you see. You see, like Sauron's tower falling at the end in the film, and like mm-hmm. the eye winking out, and it'll, everything mm-hmm. in Mordor's like falling to pieces. It's like Mordor's still there. I yeah. mean, granted, and... it's like dank as, and it's all destroyed. But like, mm-hmm. you could still, if it, if it were a game, you could still mm-hmm. run a game set in Mordor after that. Yeah, and that is that's a very good point because um, the the end for the Chronicle of the Crowns campaign will essentially come when the characters. Uh, all of them, not just Matthew's character, when all of them have reached a point where uh, I suppose they have 
enough of a resolution, whether that is like ranging all the way from like utter defeat uh, yeah. to um, to glorious success. Uh, when we have reached that point, uh, we might call it there. I, I imagine like when we reach that kind of situation, uh, we're going to have a post-session talk, maybe even during the session, we, we will have a yeah. uh, short con- conversation about like, is, is this it? Do we feel comfortable leaving it here? And um, uh, what that might be, uh, I don't know. There's it's it, because the game is uh, driven by the player characters' uh, beliefs, so it, it sort of it morphs as we go, yeah. um, like what the end point will eventually be. But we are definitely heading towards some possibilities now because we are uh, going to be taking head on the, what is basically <laughs> has been foreshadowed as more or less a big bad not necessarily the big bad but yeah. one of them anyway uh from the very start of the game and um we're sort of heading towards one of these junctions where we could end the campaign in a few sessions i think uh, if we all collectively came to that conclusion and uh, carrying on from there there's definitely um room for further campaigns and that also um because there's like stuff we haven't explored stuff we can flesh out things we've let by the wayside which we could return to with a different campaign different characters all that also it would then be carrying on with the sort of inspirational source material from tolkien as well because tolkien's world is uh like the, the, we are introduced to the war of the ring period right in the the, the trilogy yes. yep. and um that whole story constantly underlines the fact that however miserable and dark things are now however hard and grueling this struggle is everything is a pale shade from something more vital and something more important that happened long ages ago we can carry on the cycle i think uh, in in our sort of campaign world as well the sort of as i mentioned before the uh, the sort of like short form pitch for the campaign is that this world has already experienced a lot of this sort of turning of the cycle and yeah. uh, the center not uh, being able to uh, withstand uh, the uh, the ages. And uh, I think when we come to the conclusion of this, there's definitely going to be uh, more cycles of of story and epochs of time that we could go through in the same same campaign setting, definitely. And now it would probably not be in like on an idea level whereas uh smoke and snow wide open options you could put in um sort of like a sort of very delineated pieces of content for example like the hot springs island that we've talked about yeah. you could put that in the ocean and instantly there's a new campaign in your yes. world yeah. um i think we're looking at something a little bit more restricted because it's kind of kind of very focused on a very sort of i don't want to say limited area but like designated area yes Uh, the the world that we fleshed out it's about this particular piece of a continent i guess yeah yeah that's my very (laughs) long-winded yeah but i think as well like one of the reasons these uh these sort of like long form campaigns and you know all these like stories where someone said oh they're running the same campaign for like 60 years or whatever appealed to me is because of that whole thing you were saying in like lord of the rings where like tolkien's effectively like oh, i'm going to write a mythology for for, for britain for, mm-hmm. for england mm-hmm. and he's like oh uh, because it's a mythology and obviously he's incredibly skilled as a writer he's like oh it's not just good enough to be like oh here's an adventure story that's happening about a magic ring it's mm-hmm. like you've really got to have that sense of like history and as you say like previous ages that have had knock-on effects to this mm-hmm. and i like the i like the sort of callbacks he does where you know like you go and you go and sit where they do like elrond and he's like oh i was there when the strength of men failed mm-hmm. and stuff like that and i like the idea of like whenever you hear people talking about the these games have been running for like 50 years or whatever they'll be like Oh, and uh, the, this king in such and such a land, that was actually like a player character from a game I ran 15 years mm-hmm, ago. And mm-hmm, that, now he's mm-hmm. the king. And I love that idea of sort of using successive games to like build up the history of your mm-hmm. of your campaign world. So it's not just me yeah. being like, here's the history, like crack on players. It's me being like, 
here's some history I did, but also like a lot of this like players have done yeah. as the game's gone along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is definitely a, a very nice aspect of the long form games, and uh, it, it's kind of like a, there's some in board games you have these things called legacy games where you you have something that is kind of going to stick around in your copy of the game. Yeah, because I mean, from, from what I understand, and I'm not a big board gamer, but from mm-hmm. what I understand, like legacy games, the idea is that you say you retain something from previous mm-hmm. games so that like each time you play it, it's like slightly different based on what happened previously. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's like a, I don't know, like a rule or a resolution that you come into on one play of the game, and then that is kept there for the future games and uh, i also like that sort of like legacy building um aspect of long campus which i haven't had a lot of opportunities to do but uh, i definitely have that in mind for for this burning wheel game and uh for whenever we get around somewhere in the distant future uh, yeah i mean I, I also think as well i mean we've spoke a bit about this with smoke and snow but again with the the world you the, that's been created for chronicle of the crowns Mm-hmm. I think again, that's something that you you wouldn't necessarily have to stick with, like Burning Wheel, to use that setting. No, no, not at all. Because don't get me wrong, like obviously it's been creative, like Burning Wheel in mind, and it works mm-hmm. really well for that. And you know me, I love Burning Wheel. But uh, if you if you let's say you were like in a, f- a few months after you'd wrap this this up, you were like, oh, actually, I want to like move the timeline on five hundred years in this world, and like. We're gonna we're gonna do like a world to that number game, but set in this campaign setting. I, I think mm-hmm. you could quite happily do that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I suppose that is a um, <laughs> very versatile asset uh, to put it in very clinical terms. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, that... as, as I've said, I, I'm all about making my life as a GM like as easy as possible mm-hmm. when it comes to running a game. So for me, like all these notes I'm sort of building up now of like stuff that you guys are doing and I've got this timeline and I know what mm-hmm. the gods were and what they are in this world. If I then run a game in the future and I'm like, oh, I've already got all these notes. All I've got to do is like, again, let's say 100 years in the future, the next mm-hmm. game is, I've just got to go, like, oh, all I've got to do is like fill in the time between this game and the next game. I don't have to start everything from scratch mm-hmm. again. I've already got a lot of sort of inspirational material there. And one of the things I, I like doing, and I, I've done it in several games that you've played in, is when we get to like the end of a campaign, is then sort of saying, like, oh, what do you, just sort of very briefly, what do you think happened to your character after this? Mm-hmm. And so, so let's say we're, let's say we're doing, um, we've reached the end of Smoke and Snow, why has got like the, the, the Sunblade or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to settle down and into my role as like the night defender of New mm-hmm. Zealand, and we're going to do this. Then a hundred years in the future, you can like do like a little callback. You're like, oh, maybe, maybe there's like a statue of. I mean, we've done a bit of this already, but you know, maybe there's a statue of like Weimar there, or maybe mm-hmm. his names appears on like a wall, like a scroll listing all the previous like night defenders and stuff like that. Yeah, or like just <clears throat> uh, not even like sticking to characters there although like that is entirely something that i also want to do in in my games like that is that is the uh the, hey man like, I, I didn't go start in a new religion just to be forgotten yeah yeah because you because you did that <laughs> um but i was thinking for weimar especially like uh it would be very cool then to come back 100 years have passed different characters we come back to new Zealand. it's a like a grown merchant port maybe now yeah. and they've got these two towers the two towers of sealand everyone knows those now yeah. and um the the knight defender of the two towers uh is like the badge of office is the sun sword yeah and and if you cannot you you know lift up the sun sword and proclaim you your oath to defend oh, it's uh, like, like molnir like whosoever yeah. is worthy yeah. to possess this. are you are you worthy because not anyone not just anyone can defend uh new zealand we need someone who is worthy whose heart is in the right place and um the the true test is then uh you lift up the sun sword and you proclaim your oath uh to defend the people uh, with your life if necessary and uh uh, and that's how you <laughs> how, you, how yeah. they run that particular position that like stuff like that is a very 
high grade payoff, <laughs> I think, See, for I, the games I, that we play. I, I love that as an idea. I also quite like the idea of like instead of something like how old your character is, like in his twenties or thirties. Yeah, but, yeah. But so I nebulously, I, I'm thinking of it like thirties, somewhere around there, and maybe he doesn't even know because he, he yeah. wasn't really in the like he was. He's not a noble. He. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, he's not really sure himself. I, I, I'm thinking he's in the 30s somewhere there. I, I, I quite like the idea of like maybe instead of doing like 100 years in the future, well, realistically, if you're a human in a sort of fantasy foam medieval, you ain't going to live to be 100. No, but like <laughs> maybe going like, oh, let's move the setting on 20 years, 30 mm -hmm. years, or something like that, and then you can potentially do like, oh yeah, like if you, if you rock into New Zealand, like Wymore or somebody's there as like he's now like the old man who's like yeah. overseeing like, the city. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And you can you can sort of make some more like obviously like me doing it as an NPC, but you, mm -hmm. can, you can still sort of do that those more immediate callbacks to uh, mm -hmm. and, and I see it's like a little like added bonus to anyone who played in like the previous game where you can be like oh yeah that's stuff that you sort of said at the end like this is what I think my character's going to do now mm -hmm. like it didn't just get like wrote in my notes and like forgotten about. It, it's had this knock-on effect in a future game, and even if that's just like, oh, there's there's like old man Weimar as like the, the the king of like the town now. Yeah, it it's still it's like oh here's a bit of a bonus. Your like character's actions had a long-lasting impact on this campaign world, and and even little things like we've we've already done in the game like um, Rob's first character like got killed by all those giant beetles, yeah. and then after the ten year uh, after the ten year sort of time skip. Like then the main tavern's called the Hunter and Beetle because like the legend mm -hmm. of how he like sacrificed himself for his friends yeah. got like sort of like passed down and like distorted, mm -hmm. and a tavern's been named after him. And little callbacks like that—it's just a way of saying like, oh, what your character does in the game matters. Yeah, which is I think that's the uh... <laughs> not to be too uh, too cheesy here, but the 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 true reward was the uh, the memories we made along that's the way it. when we played the game. That's it. The, the memories were inside us all along. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but truly, like that's that's the thing. Like I'm not gonna remember the statistical bonuses of the Sun Sword, but I'm gonna remember that uh, Colin, who is is no longer unfortunately due to scheduling, able to partic participate in this, this particular game. But he started out in it, and Colin uh, originally found the Sun Sword. I will remember that, and um, Colin's character. Uh, who was not of the uh, appropriate temperament uh, for the sun, so it picked it up, almost killed himself. <laughs> so yeah. that's the stuff that I will remember, not the nitty gritty. <laughs> that's it. Like you say, it's like I I'm not going to remember like blow by blow every like combat that, we that we've done in like smoke and snow. But you best believe I'm going to remember that like scene where Weimar and like brother Lomas were like getting dragged oh, yeah. towards that like roper <laughs> and they like you're frantically trying like everything you can to like get away from it it's like dragging you towards its mouth <laughs> and likewise in the burning wheel game it's like oh yeah i'm not going to remember like every single like little thing yeah. that we how, did. how does forking work this or how do you yeah. how do you help or what's the link test <laughs> exactly but I, i'm going i'm going to remember sort of like enjoying like my, my dwarf character like talking about like, how like, everything was fated and when we like delved in and we're looking for like the lost forges and mm -hmm. like some of the stuff we did last session like, like meeting the poet and like training with the poet and stuff like that mm -hmm. and I, I should probably interject here she probably won't listen to this but i should probably give like a big shout out to like my <laughs> missus my long suffering wife hannah who's been <laughs> in some podcast episodes with me who like every time i run a game or like play in one of johannes's games has to put up with me for about an hour like talking about it afterwards and we normally finish like fairly late in the evening so like and I, and I, I'm, I'm normally like we finish and i'm like oh i really i really should go to bed i'm just gonna go downstairs and have a glass of water or whatever and go, go downstairs and like hannah blaster is always like oh how did your game go and i'm like let me tell you about them 15 well, successes well, i've got in the last night's game <laughs> let me get my notepad out that's it yeah but bless her <laughs> i'm long suffering uh, apologies for me as well uh hannah for for yeah, being party to that's this, a, that's fine. I, I, I don't know whether you, your own missus like has to enjoy the sort of like um, a, a little bit, but um, I, I think it may maybe more in my case a um, like when I get uh, excited or really into the thing that is happening. Maybe I'm a little bit loud sometimes <laughs> as we play. So 
it's 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 been more about that rather than regaling uh oh. <laughs> blow by blow I, the... I, 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 I was sort of I, I went i went downstairs like say to have like a glass of water and whatever and like watch a bit of tv after your game finish mm-hmm. i was like like say you know you, you get like enthused and you're like really getting into mm-hmm. a game i can't just like then switch that off and like go to sleep yeah. that, that that's why yeah. i'm normally yeah. like oh, i can't yeah. go on too late so i'm like if we run till 12 i'm probably not getting asleep yeah. till like half two in the morning so yeah. um well, we finished. I'm like, I'll oh, go downstairs, watch a bit of TV, wind down, have a drink, whatever. And um, I, I, I happened to walk through the kitchen. Like my, my wife was like having a smoke out of the back, and she was like, she was like, oh, oh you, you're going straight to bed now. I was like, oh no, because I'm really like pumped up after the game. I'm going to like. Mm-hmm. She was like, oh, d- d- did it not go well? And I was like, no, it went really well. Really enjoyed it, <laughs> but like, like I'm, I'm like reared up now, and like I can't. I'm going to need like at least half an hour. To like yeah. chill out, so I can like go to sleep. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be lying in bed. Like those no, fifteen successes were amazing. <laughs> yeah, and that is that is something that uh, I have um, like noted uh, a, a lot during my, uh, I suppose, uh, career <laughs> DMing yeah. um, or, or running games rather. Um, the DM slash GM. Um, buzz is extreme really real like you yeah, yeah. you you run a session you're getting really into it maybe you prep something that you're really proud of you think people are gonna like maybe you tailor made something that you know that someone has been looking for for a long time and you just can't wait to drop it on them uh, like so many chocolate eggs with surprises inside and um and then you get that uh very human experience of watching other people enjoy something you've made and um, and you you also uh, like enjoy the thing that you've made and you come away from a session. I know that I do a lot of the time. I come away from a session with so much energy. Yeah, it's it's just impossible. Like at, at some point, I will just go to bed and be like, well, I'm just gonna lay down here. I will run through all these thoughts, and I just hope that at some point the <laughs> sort of horizontal positioning will just drop me off to sleep because <laughs> but, but it always makes me laugh because I've normally got like a book or something like on the cabinet next to like my bed mm-hmm. to like read for a bit uh, like before I go to sleep and Hannah always laughs because I'll be like oh I'm going, going to bed I'm going to like read for a bit and then get some sleep and she'll be like oh yeah, yeah you start reading you read about two pages and then you'll like fall asleep and I'm like that's because like I find the most boring thing I can mm-hmm. possibly find and I put that as my reading material because I'm like Oh, if, if I'm already like pumped up from a game or something, if I just read like a really boring or like sort of factually like dense book, like mm-hmm. I, like I'll probably grab one of my my, my herb books, like my sort of real world mm-hmm. like herbology books, where mm-hmm. they're interesting. But you know, if you try and just read through like page upon page, like, oh, and then there's this herb and here's what you can do. Like it soon like gets you off to sleep and sort of gets you gets you sort of like mm-hmm. back down from that high of energy that you're talking about. But yeah, I have to explain to him like no, I, I deliberately pick boring stuff to like read. Because mm-hmm. if I pick something exciting, I'll, I'll I'll sort of come down from reading the game, and then I'll be like, oh, I'm really gripped by like this novel I'm like reading. Oh, I'm... And then like, yeah. you know, like f- it's like five o'clock in the morning, and you're like, I've not slept at all. Yeah, this is like yeah, I've had far too many cups of coffee, but maybe I should take five more. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think as well it's as you were saying as a. Uh, when you're a GM, obviously you invest so much of yourself and your time and your energy in a game. And, you know, there's always that little bit of apprehension when you come to a game where you're like, oh, I hope everyone oh, yeah. enjoys it and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. then you have the actual session, you sort of run that and you've got the, the different sort of energy of running the session as opposed to like, the anticipation and the prep. Mm-hmm. And then when it's sort of, it's done for all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to just like, switch that off afterwards because i don't know yeah. about you but for me like we run the session i say to you guys at the end i'm like oh what are you guys thinking about doing mm-hmm. the next session you, you like tell me and then even if i don't touch my notes i don't touch the keyboard for like another two days i'm immediately mm-hmm. thinking like all oh, right so you know, what's gonna happen with that like next session like oh they yeah they're going across to here and like this is going on there and you sort of start running over it in your mind and again you I find yeah. it dead difficult to just like switch off from that. Yeah. And I think for me specifically, I, um, we, last time I was on, uh, on your show here, um, I think we did, uh, well, one of the last times, uh, some time ago now, uh, there was a, uh, discussion we had about prep. Yeah. And, um, I think my prep has really strongly 
pivoted towards uh, not necessarily writing a lot of things down, but I start much like yourself, uh, no doubt, uh, at the end where we sort of get to that point where I'm, I'm asking like, okay, so what's the sort of general idea you guys want to engage with next time? Um, because Burning Wheel runs on whatever the characters are, are engaging with. Yeah. Uh, and because uh, you, you as players determine that so i, I want to get like the temperature uh if not the exact thing but i, I want to get the idea so yeah. that i can get the um the juices flowing and uh my prep increasingly i find is just me getting that sort of spark of ignition from you guys and then just thinking about imagery and and cool scenes yeah for a week and then maybe an hour before the actual session, I'll write down like some bullet points uh, yeah. that I've, I've come up with. Uh, and I think increasingly visual, like I increasingly think of like cool visual scenes where your, your characters are doing something. Uh, that's That's been an interesting thing to note. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I've moved a little bit towards being a, a bit more visual with my prep. So like, if, for instance, I'm like, oh, yeah, you guys are traveling to like a swamp or a stone circle, say, mm. next session, like, one of the first things I'll do is like, hit up the old like Google image search and I'll be like, oh, stone mm-hmm. circles. And then I'll just yeah, scroll, swamp. just <laughs> scroll through all the pictures until I find one where I'm like, oh, that kind of looks interesting. And then you can look at that and you can like, pick out some details. Like, you can be like, oh, there's like, there's like a bush with some like red berries like in the corner of this picture of this like swamp. Like, oh, maybe mm-hmm. I could do something with that. And like, maybe they could find mm-hmm. some like forage stuff where you go like, Oh, the, the, the sort of stone circle in in this it's got some like weird sort of like designs on it oh, and th- this like attached story saying like oh it was it was part of there's some sort of stream flying past it that had like religious significance like, oh maybe i can do something with that mm-hmm. yeah i mean i, I sort of the, the template i'm i'm talking about that i use is uh i basically took from um mike shay's like return of the lazy gm book mm-hmm. where he's like oh I'm not telling you to do no prep, but I'm telling you just to like focus on the bits which are going to get you like the maximum like reward for, for, for putting in the prep on it. And uh, I sort of started off with that, and I've gradually like tweaked it for my own like personal tastes. But again, it varies by like session. So you guys are exploring this like three level like dungeon at the minute, and it's like from from the first session, I I just sketched out the three levels got some descriptions of the rooms and what's in there and because you've been exploring it for the last two sessions i've not really had to do any extra stuff because i'm like i've got mm-hmm. the dungeon planned now I'm, I'm just running the dungeon so yeah. that that's given me like a bit more time to go like all oh, right okay well, what's going on outside of this you know maybe i can add a bit more to the cavern system and stuff like that but the actual dungeon bit that's done i don't really need to worry about yeah. it yep yeah. I find that that is a very comfortable place to be. Yeah. Uh, we've had that happen a couple times in the Burning Wheel campaign, but most of the time that is not something that happens because the uh, the game, as, as mentioned, does follow the the beliefs of the characters at any given time. Um, sort of the, the beliefs put the spotlight on and then we need to come up with stuff for that spotlight. So um, there's been a couple of times where I've, I've prepped, like, we've established, like, okay, we're going to this particular area. We're going to do this. We're going to go through here. And then I've, I've had that in my mind. And uh, it's, a very, it's a very nice place to be as a GM when you're, you're sort of like, I kind of know everything now because yeah. there's a little bit of a, bit of a like, containment going on here. Yeah. So that I know that they're not going to go off necessarily from this particular area. And I figured that stuff out a couple of weeks back. That I, I've had some of my most relaxed sessions because of that sort of thing, uh, where I have a solid idea from weeks back of what's you know in the vicinity of the characters. Yeah, I mean, and it's something I, obviously with um, Smoke Snow being like more of a hex crawly style game, mm. it, it's something I'll do in that where when we get to like one of these little like bottlenecks where it's like, all right, you're in this dungeon for like. Mm-hmm. so many sessions or whatever because i've basically what i've done is I've, I've used like a random generator to be like oh yeah there's like three monster layers in this big hex there's there's mm-hmm. one dungeon there's a few bits and pieces but i don't really like define them and then all i'll do is every time i'm sort of uh i've got a bit of a break where i don't need to be prepping the immediate session i'll be like all right okay um w- what's the nearest dungeon or potential adventure site that i've i've not done anything for 
and I'll just like write a few like brief notes for that. Then next time I'll be like, all right, what's the next one out? So by the time you guys get to like exploring that area, I've at the very least got some like brief notes on it that I can run with. And that was the same for like the um, the, the temple of like the solar order that you originally found like the sun sword mm -hmm. in. I was like, I had that prepped for like a couple of sessions beforehand. So when you guys were like, oh yeah, let's go see what that ruined temple is. I'm like, right, I've got the map set up. I know what's in there. I've just got to fill in a few little details and I'm like, good to go. And again, it, it makes it a lot less of a sort of weight, like an immediate weight mm -hmm. on your shoulders as a GM. Yep. Um, this, for some reason, just popped into my mind. Um, I enjoy Star Wars with a Number a lot. Was with a Number also like that book <laughs> quite a bit. And uh, Crawford's... It's fair, it's a good book. Of, <laughs> yeah. One of Crawford's uh, things from the very start has been this section in his books where he talks about um, like make filler content. Yeah. Um, like not like you know piles and piles of it but like have these if you want to flesh them out fully sure but even if if it's just a skeleton of something um, to put in the file so that when someone can't make it we need to do something you know off the main interest bit or uh, maybe we, we're just you know doing some other random stuff or we we get stranded on a uh, on a place that we didn't plan for uh, and mm -hmm. you'll you'll then have these sort of plug and play <laughs> yeah. pieces of content. And I've always looked at that. I've read that uh, in in so many of these books, and I'm like, that sounds really like comfort comforting to yeah. like have something in the side. And I've never really had that myself. Um, and I don't quite know why, because I've I've run a fair bit of Star Wars Number, for example, yeah. with with the um, uh, group that we played in uh, well, this years now, several years. We need to get back to that game. Yeah, um, and we we did this very explicit like here's here's some jobs you guys can do. Like this is like the the notice board of yeah. gigs. You, you just pick whatever. And it it seems upon reflection. <laughs> It should have been a shoe in, like it should have been very easy to have that running on the side. But I guess we never truly had like the necessity of doing that um, because we sort of, I suppose, we started generating our own stuff on the fly, sort of naturally, yeah. in enough detail that we, I didn't need to have that file on the side. But that's something I think uh, I would like to maybe try to achieve. On like this isn't so much on like the players at all but i'm just thinking for the next star of that number game um i would maybe try to have that sort of even like fully fleshed out pieces of content yes. that are that are sort of simple and sharp enough that you can actually drag and drop that stuff yeah. uh, i i think i want to experiment with that kind of thing because i've already always thought that it sounds very smart and comforting but I've never actually done it, and I don't yeah. quite know why. <laughs> I mean, I think when you're talking about the, the sort of job boards and stars of that number, I think mm. one of the strengths when you ran Scum and Villainy for us, like the sort of PBTA, mm. like Star Wars mm. knockoff, is that because that game explicitly, like, oh, you're playing like the Han Solo types, and mm -hmm. that game's explicitly based around, like, oh, here's the missions available, pick a mission, come up with a plan, make a mm -hmm. roll to see how your plan comes out, and then we'll pick up with like, the interesting bit when it either mm -hmm. goes wrong or when some complications come up. Yeah, I think that worked really well because that sort of job determining and job role thing was sort of like mm -hmm. hard-coded into the system. Yeah. So like there, there was no like, oh, you know, I've got to worry about oh, how, do, how do I set up this job board, how do I make it look plausible? Because mm -hmm. part of accepting like the format of the game is that you know that at the start of each session you're going to be like right okay these are the jobs that are available let's select mm -hmm. one and just like go with it and see how we get on mm -hmm. so i think that's one of the one of the strengths of that particular game like, like we said with that all powered yeah. by the apocalypse games it runs a very specific sort of focused game and runs it well yeah yeah it's, it's very sleek for that specific like the yeah. the roving space freelancers you know scraping by uh, which is uh, a very appealing yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I think to sort of highlight the, the, the difference between like your stars of that number game and the scum and villainy game both of which mm. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. is that 
they both ostensibly had us playing sort of like slightly freewheeling, like dodgy mm-hmm. sort of like merchant characters. However, in the Stars Without Number game, we we have the freedom to do that, but also do other stuff mm-hmm. and sort of diverge yep. away from that. Whereas because the Scum and Villainy is so focused on that, the game sort of like keeps you in that lane. And mm-hmm. there's, there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's 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 the beauty of that yeah, game. <laughs> it, it does what it does, and it does it very well. But if you want to sort of step outside that lane, then the game the game's not got anything for you. Whereas if you're, oh, we want to start off as traders, but maybe we might want to become mercenaries, and maybe we might mm-hmm. want to do this something a bit more general, like Stars Without Number. It doesn't necessarily have as much support for one of those styles of games, but also that's kind of a strength because. Because it's got like a little bit for like all the different types of games, you can mm-hmm. diverge if you want, and you're not fighting against the game system to try and do yeah. that. Yeah, which is like circling all the way back to uh, me liking to sample different stuff. Yeah, um, I, I very much enjoy it when a game is specifically tooled for something. Uh, that does not mean that I, because I've repeatedly said I, I really enjoy Star Wars with a number very broad like you've said yeah. there's a lot of things you can do with that game uh however i would not pick up scum and villainy and do dungeon crawling that yeah. would be a that would be the wrong uh tool for that job you can do it but you maybe want to use something else for it much like you 5e yeah. is is currently doing the thing that um third edition and 3.5 did back in the the explosion of d20 stuff where like yeah you can do investigative horror with 5e i would maybe not do that because i feel like maybe it's not the the best tool that i have i mean i think if you if you wanted to run ostensibly like a standard like D &D, like fantasy game in a sort of five edition the fifth edition mold and like you wanted to have like a session that just dipped its toe into like horror a little bit, yeah. yeah you you could quite easily do that. But Absolutely. If you were going to make that the major like focus mm-hmm. of your game, th- there's games out there which will support you more and do a better job of doing that. And it's it's always the it's always a bit of a sort of dilemma for me. And like I say, when I've when I've talked about like fate as opposed to like D twenty and stuff like that and PBTA, is there's advantages to using like a very general system. But yeah. if there is a very specific system for that particular sort of game that you want to run and all of your players are on board with like, yes, we are running this type of game, mm-hmm. then the, the specific systems by sheer virtue of their nature will probably do a better job of it. But you've all got to be on board with the fact that like, yeah, we're all playing like s- space smugglers. Mm-hmm. Whereas if someone something like bouncing in and they're like, oh, actually I want to play a, I want to play like a free form, like space traveling wizard. You're like, well, scum and villain, he's got nothing for you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Whereas if, if you're running stars without number and you're like, oh yeah, okay, we're, we're going to play, um, we're going to play space mercenaries or whatever, but we, we might segue into some other stuff. It will do that. It's not got quite as much specifically tailored for space mercenaries, mm-hmm. but by the same point, if anyone's like, oh yeah, I want to play a, I want to play a space wizard in it. You can like bust out your like codex of the black sun and be like, I got your wizard rules right here. Like, yeah. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, how much do you want? <laughs> yeah. I've got all your space wizards here, and I I really like that about um, so, uh, yeah, Star Wars Number uh, it, because there's from the pre the current version is the revised, yeah. um, but for the previous version, um, which is they're entirely like you very easy to transfer between editions, but there's a lot of supplemental material that Crawford has made yeah. for basically entirely new games like if you wanted to turn uh stars without number into uh like a space like trading game uh, oh yeah there's sons of gold yeah um and you you can get your exo sheets out and you can start making that big space buck and so, uh, I mean, i've got most of them supplements <laughs> in like pdf yeah, and like I said, I remember looking at Sons of Gold, and I was like, "Man, there is some detail in that book." Yeah, like it's maybe it's like stopping short of like currency speculation, yep. but like you're you're like trading all about it. You you can run a just a straight up merchant, like mercantile, 
you know, business game. I, I'm, I'm actually kind of like low key hoping that um, when, because obviously, like Worlds of that number is like a much newer game. Mm-hmm. It's, it's much more recent. I'm hoping. I mean, I don't. I don't know what it'd be, but I'm, I'm hoping there'd be some similar kinds of supplements for world to that number and i know you, there doesn't tend to be like the specialization you get in like sci-fi so much in fantasy but i'd love to see some like supplemental stuff for like world to that number being like oh here's how you could tailor it to like be this specific type of fantasy so like oh yeah we've done mm-hmm. a swords and sorcery supplement oh we've done like a sort of post apoc i know it's a bit post apocalyptic anyway mm-hmm. but we've done like a sort of gonzo post apocalyptic like book Oh, you want to make things a bit more like grim, dark, and gritty? Here's like a book which to- tells you how mm-hmm. to do that. I- I'd love to see that sort of same level of support that Stars Like mm. Numbers had for World to That Number. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what's coming down the pipe there. Uh, definitely, because there's there's some really like 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 I said, there's sort of big add-ons you can put on yeah. to some of these previous products, which you can. Like one of the things that I, I kind of keep coming back to when I think, like, oh yeah, I want to run stars with a number. There's um, a supplement called Darkness Visible, which is like, do you want to be, you know, James Bond spy stuff in yep. space with with lasers and you know cyborgs? Which and, sure. and to, to, to be fair, if you're if your answer is <laughs> no to that question, I don't think we've got anything in common. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's got like all the all the things for that as well. Including you being, of course, menaced by other, you know, similar secretive organizations with their own space laser cyborg spies, and um, uh, it's great because there's like that's kind of like a its own campaign in in a supplement to a game that still remains the same kind of game that you can do a lot with, yeah. even though you might be spies that doesn't you know it, the game isn't too hardwired to the spies at that point yeah, yeah it's similar to um for for white star which is another like osr space game there's um a supplement which i very much like for that which is like a third party one where um it, it's a friend of the um that the guy originally wrote white star and he's mm-hmm. like oh yeah like uh the, the guy who wrote White Star, he's like, he's like more of like you sort of like Star Wars fan, so it's all a bit sort of space opera and stuff like that. He's like, I'm more of like a Star Trek fan, so like if you want to like do White Star but do it like a bit more Star Trek rather than Star Wars, like here's a load of like additional stuff you can like mm. use for it. And I'd love to see more, well, I don't know how feasible it is, but I'd love to see more sort of games like with supplementary material where they're like, oh, the, the core games like fairly and they did this with fate to like fate worlds where it's mm. like oh the the core game's fairly generic but if you want a bit and you can do whatever you want with it you can make your own stuff obviously but if you want a bit of extra support and a bit of extra guidance when it comes to a specific type of game here's some extra stuff that you could use yeah and you've you've just reminded me of this like long-standing but very <laughs> work intensive thing that I've kind of wanted to do which is um, circling a little bit back to where we started this whole uh, conversation you could make entirely new campaigns for Burning Wheel by making new life path settings yeah so and, and but what, what I mean by that is uh, in Burning Wheel uh, when you're looking at making a, a let's say a human character um you can pick your life paths from different settings a setting could be a village uh a, like a peasant farmland a city death cult uh <laughs> whatever it might be so like making new blocks of those um is something you can do to just completely retool yeah the game which uh, like brain will is is something that is uh a little bit it's it's hard to take the wrench to that uh in in any great extent because uh things interact with each other in that game so like it's it's a bit intense to start pulling apart is what i'm saying yeah. there i guess but um what i think is entirely feasible is you start designing new blocks of these you there's there's some examples floating around that you can still find where um 
uh, the creators have made. Uh, for example, the um, like Lost, uh, what is it? Like the Lost, um, like Atlantean or whatever, which is more or less just Conan's entire life arc <laughs> made into life paths where nice. it's, it's like, oh, you're like a like a thief and then there's the pirates there's you know all the, like warlord um and and all that uh and they've got some now years out of print sort of alternative setting plugins you could put on um it's one that like you... a june style one yeah the, the the burning sands uh which is the sort of like you know uh, serial numbers off yeah type dune uh material so that's something that i've I've, as soon as I figured out um, how the uh, the life paths work, I've, I've been thinking about well, I should I should try and make my own like make my own quote unquote setting because that's kind of the setting in Burning Wheel is the life paths yes. for the characters to pick. So I've been playing around with that idea, uh, but it is it's it's a bit of work <laughs> to do. Yeah, I think that's probably putting it mildly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's something I could do or, or anyone could do. I guess. I, mean, but... I think if you if you're running it in ostensibly like fantasy setting where like the skills are the mm-hmm. same and it and it's just a matter of coming up with like different combinations of skills that go with particular life paths, mm-hmm. it's still a lot of work. But mm-hmm. but you know, I think if you were doing like an entirely different sort of setting like sci fi or something, where the Ooh, skills yeah. would need to be retooled as well, that's mm-hmm. like order of magnitudes more work. Yeah, you're you're just like doing the whole thing again yeah basically yeah. <laughs> at that point yeah but for like you could put down uh, a couple of life path uh, blocks um so like uh let's say we we want to do like gothic horror as a theme yeah yeah then then you you take the existing ones that fit like the farmer in the village and whatnot but then you start adding on the thematic stuff like the uh, there's there's not going to be like if there is an undertaker life path you toss that out because you need to you need to make it gothic yeah. horror creepy <laughs> and uh i'd actually and... love to see what um a sort of like mythos-esque game mm-hmm. doing like the with the burning wheel life paths would look like mm-hmm. obviously that'd be a hell of a lot of work should be retold yeah. skills and life paths but yeah. I, as i've said a number of times i, I quite enjoy the the sort of life path method of character creation mm-hmm. and you sort of look at it and you're like oh I've, I've sort of got like a bullet point like a little history of like my character's like life up to this point so i know oh, i was a farmer for five years and then i became a member of the town guard and yada 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 mm-hmm. I, i'd love to see about how that would work for something like a, a mythos style game where you can be like oh i was i was a professor at a, i was a student at Ockham university and then I became an associate professor and then i became the librarian or whatever and then, then i read the wrong book and i became a cultist for like six yeah. years or whatever yeah because from the librarian you can switch to the effectively like the uh the the mythos life path where yeah. you're you're like the 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 you know the the troubled occultist now at the end of your you yeah. know life path and, and i think um i think for things like um in the mythos you know there's always like the um like the Innsmouth look and there's the people who've got like a bit of like the other in mm-hmm. their ancestry like that's something you could do like very well with um burning wheels yeah. um sort of non-human trait you know like where mm-hmm. they, each non-human has like a specific trait and they have like their own life paths but i think you wouldn't even need to like come up with entirely separate life no. paths and skills to them like let's say you're like oh um I- i'm gonna i'm gonna take this particular life path and taking this gives me this trait and means i'm like descended from a deep one or whatever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then from there you just go on to like select your normal life paths but that very first one like you say oh you have to select this as your first life path if you want to be like yeah. one of the innsmouth folk mm-hmm. and you're like mm-hmm. oh yeah that gives you like this special trait which is useful for interacting with deep ones or whatever yeah yeah or it, it marks you out yeah and um and then you know it's apparent as as is the way with burning wheel like if you would have that then it would be a, a thing that is constantly probably brought up in the game is like oh you're from that area are you because yeah. because I, I i know i know you got more salt in your blood than than other people because you come from the sea 
Yeah, I mean, you, you could probably adapt like an existing, you know, like the like infamy trait or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. And you know, like, oh, well, if it gets found out, like people are like, oh, you want to, even if they don't, they're not immediately like, oh, you're a deep one hybrid. Or people are like, oh, you're one of them Innsmouth people, are you? Know, mm-hmm. The big, like, bulging, staring eyes, strange, mm-hmm. like, inbred folk coming from Innsmouth. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You know, always, always smell a bit of fish and a bit too much of the sea and always wearing yeah, strange okay. gold jewelry. Yeah, always a bit damp. <laughs> and then yeah. you, you throw other things that you go oh yeah but um, if you've got the deep one i think you can like uh you can go into like a an esoteric order of like dagon like priest yeah. life path or something yeah 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 you you swap from there again to the mythos life path and it's you're just like well yeah i'm now the high priest of dagon uh but you have your your thing there where you were you were born in insmith you and I don't know, you maybe you apprenticed at the local fishery, maybe yeah. you were a sailor for a bit, um, and then maybe you went to university, like you, you did your yeah. sailing, and then um, you went to university, you studied to become a doctor, uh, and then uh, you ended up uh, being, <laughs> being called back home for maybe a family reunion, and you switched into the mythos life paths and they inducted you as a as a priest now in well, the that's, order. I mean, obviously in the in the sort of like original shadow over in Smith, there's like there's the people who very obviously like embraced the heritage and they're all into like the esoteric mm-hmm. order of Dagon and they're all waiting for that the great day when they all return to the sea and whatever. But there's also like the main character who like knows like nothing about his ancestry his mm-hmm. like mother took him away from Innsmouth when he was like very young and he's had like a nice normal life but he gets like drawn back into it so you know if, mm-hmm. if you wanted to just right, forgive the pun if you wanted to just like dip your toe in that like that sort of water and just be like oh yeah okay I'm with this but I want to go purely for normal life paths after that you could do that but also you could be like oh yeah I want to fully embrace this like mythos vibe and sort of like run with that mm-hmm. so I think and that'd be right. Basically, what I'm saying is, I'd like to see like a burning wheel version of like every setting I can like think of is what I'm really <laughs> yeah. saying. But but I don't want to have to do the work to make all of those settings because it will be a lot mm-hmm. of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it would. It would. But it, I guess it's one of those uh, sort of aspirational things, at least for me. Yeah. Like, would be would be cool to set aside the time and cook something up in in detail. That's like, it. And I mean, all, all joking aside. It's not so much a matter of like, oh, I wouldn't be willing to put the work in. It's like, who's got the time to to, to put yeah. aside that amount of time to do the work? And then, like I said, Burning Wheel, as it is, is like a fairly hard sell when it comes mm-hmm. to like getting a group together. And like, often people are like, oh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, my favourite fantasy game that I'm never going to run or I'm never going to play or whatever. But can you imagine how hard it would be to try and sell someone on like oh yeah we're not only going to run that burning wheel we're going to run that weird mythos burning wheel that i've come up with yeah i've i've made my like 100 page house rules for (laughs) so uh it's it's no longer 1400 it's 1500 now that you need to read that's the hard sell yeah but no it's 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 really um cool the basic framework is something that i think could work with a lot of stuff including like just straight up like Ram Stroke of Dracula, like oh, gothic, yeah. gothic horror stuff, just ooh, mm, get him in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, it's it's one of those things where I think that the specificity of the system and the fact it is so strongly tied into like its setting mm-hmm. is an amazing strength of it because it really captures that feel of the game. It's sort of go the fantasy game it's going for, but mm-hmm. also again, it's a it's a bit of a downside, really, because you can't. You couldn't just pick up Bernie Wayne and be like, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run like a 1930s spy thriller with this." Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, potentially, if you're like, I've got a few months to spare, like retooling this, you could do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But as opposed to like a more general system where, like, you're like, oh, it's, it's not going to capture like this Tolkien vibe quite as well as Burning Wheel. But if I want to do something else with it, I've also not got to completely rewrite it myself. Yeah. Well, also, one, I, one day. I, I was going to say, I love the fact that, like, whatever subject we like, start talking about, we inevitably end up talking about how good Burning Wheel is. <laughs> I, I think I think when I eventually like, pass through this world, I'm going to have that like carved on my like gravestone, mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or I'm going to have some I'm going to have some complaint about the girls being too specific, like carved. In. <laughs> like, I forgot to buy shoes. Yeah, or, or yeah, I forgot to buy shoes or like. 
But I had a persona point. <laughs> I, I never did get that mold breaker off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's again. I think it's, and we've talked about this a few times, where because it's a game where Luke Crane was basically like, "Here's here's the game me and my group like playing. We're not really mm-hmm. bothered if anyone like buys it. We just sort of put it out. Mm-hmm. Makes people have asked, and they don't really like push it." In the same way, like a company that's like, yeah, we want to make mega books out of this game, mm-hmm. do like, like you know, what's even like Fifth Ed or whatever. Mm-hmm. They're not really pushing it as much. I, I think, unfortunately, it's it's a little bit more difficult to get into. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we've we've had a lot of chats about this because we, <laughs> I, I, uh, when we floated the idea that, okay, um, actually. Like we might all be interested in, you know, trying out Burning Wheel, yeah, uh, here uh, with a with a like a long form campaign, and we decided to, you know, take the chance because we had the people, we had the time, we had the commitment. We decided, yeah. well, maybe let's try, let's try if this is going to work for us. And um, uh, where was I going with this? Um, I started the whole thing out with basically like. Let's let's you know book our normal session slot. However, it's basically going to be me talking to you at you about Burning Wheel <laughs> yep. uh, to um, sort of get us on board with the various idiosyncrasies, the the logic of the the system, and all this. Which already you're spending a session on that. Yeah, and I mean, I, I also think, and I know we've spoke about this previously, mm-hmm. but I also think as well, as I've said on a number of occasions, you you ran like a, a small sort of convention scenario for um, myself and Matthew, which I'm trying to remember what the, the name of the scenario was. Uh, d- a trouble in Hawken, uh, trouble in Hawken, I think, was the uh, first yeah, it was, bit. Yeah, it was uh, th- no, it, it's something. Um, I have it in my. I'll, I'll go look see in my materials here, but the uh, it, the it had the the big name, the overarching name, and then the three segments had their own names. Twilight in the Duchy of Adorben. That is the overarching name of it. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah and, and you ran that for myself and Matthew, and as I said at the time, and I've said since, I, I've had that burning wheel for a while, but I was like, I, I think I sort of get it but i'm i'm not mm-hmm. sure because it's a little bit obtuse to put it mildly mm-hmm. in some senses and i think it is one of those games where you only really sort of get to grips with it once you've played it a bit mm-hmm. so again it's it's quite a sort of, as we we're talking about campaigns if you try and like get people to invest a load of stuff a lot of time and effort up front and you're like oh it's gonna it's gonna you're in for the long haul once you like sign up for this it, it's a lot more difficult to get people to invest in it. And if you say, oh, yeah, we're going to play Burning Wheel, but like it's probably going to take you like a good few sessions before you, you understand like the basics of it and stuff like that. It's a lot harder to sell than if you're like, oh, yeah, we're going to we're going to mm-hmm. run like a simple D&D game. You have the basics down in like half an hour and then you can just like, run with it. Yeah. Or here's your, um, I don't know, pick your system of choice from Power by the Apocalypse. And you, you put down maybe like three x's on this sheet like you you pick from this menu you put down three of your picks yeah all the rules uh, are on this playbook you need yeah yeah let's let's go we'll, we'll figure it out as we go yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah it, that is that is not the case and i mean we, we've cause obviously because uh, matthew's on holiday for a bit you're going to be running like a couple of like tremulous one shots for mm-hmm. us which for anyone who doesn't know is like a pbta like mythos game and John Drury's not played it before. I we both played it and run it a number of times. Mm-hmm. But when he was like asking about it, we're like, D- don't, don't worry about the rules. Like everything you need will be on like your playbook. It, it's fine, and you can reasonably expect like within like ten fifteen minutes of the start of the session, you will pretty much have down like everything you need for the mm-hmm. rest of the session. Like your you'll have the basics of testing down, which is dead easy in PBTA, and you'll maybe have one or two special little abilities, but all those rules are on your character sheet. Yeah. Whereas, like, I, I wouldn't say even now, like, given the, like I say, the 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 70-plus hours of, like, Burning Wheel we've played in this game and the, like, 
nearly 10 hours we did in Twilight and the Duchy of Adobe. Mm-hmm. I still wouldn't say now, like, oh, yeah, I've, I've got 100% lock on, like, Burning Wheel. Mm-hmm. I'd say I understand a hell of a lot more now than I did when I first started playing it, mm-hmm. to the point where, like, I, I, I don't know, I'd have to do a bit more reading before I felt comfortable running it, but I, if I did want to run it, I'd now go, like, oh, yeah, okay, I just need to do a bit of reading and I'll, I'll be fine. Whereas, like, the the thought of even like vaguely trying to run it when I first got the books and read them, I was just like, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like I said, even now I wouldn't say I'd got a hundred percent lock on it. And we've yeah. like we've like played nearly like just with this current group of people, we've played like, mm-hmm. like ninety hours of it. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's been great. It's all been great fun. But if you say to like someone who's just rocked up to your table, like, yeah, it could be like ninety hours of like game time, and you probably you probably you probably know about seventy percent of it. Mm-hmm. It's quite intimidating. You're, yeah, you're you're comfortable enough to turn to the session, turn up. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's a it's his own beast uh, in this regard, like thoroughly, <laughs> because it, it asks yeah. for a lot of. Uh, I don't know what the word. I think uh, like investment. Into yeah, for it. into um, a bit of system mastery, and when I say a bit, that is scalable to what you want out of the game. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't need like you don't need to know the books back to back. You'll do fine if you just you know figure out the basic resolution stuff. You're good. Uh, yeah. you, you're you're good to go, and then. Uh, if you do need some of the subsystems, different m- kinds of magic going on, more intricate resolution stuff, that's all there. But um, yeah, uh, like it does ask for a little bit, even just to get off the ground with the basic stuff. Yeah, I mean, I know, like in some circles, uh, so like player character optimization and whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it, is seen as a bit of a sort of like dirty word you know like yeah. oh, power gamers and whatever. Yeah, gauche <laughs> yeah exactly yeah but <laughs> i i do feel as you've been sort of saying that you can get by quite easily with like the basic knowledge of making tests in burning wheel but it rewards you having a bit more knowledge about like mm-hmm. we're talking about beliefs earlier on if you know how to set up your beliefs so you've got like discrete achievable goals mm-hmm. you will be like and we've often talked about it when we've been coming up with beliefs between sessions where you're like, oh, there's there's some beliefs that you're, like, you're always working towards and you're getting like the little sort of lesser fate points, but you, mm-hmm. you're you never really going to resolve it or not in the short term. So you don't get like the slightly better alpha points mm-hmm. you can get from completely wrapping something up. Or you can go, like, all right, I'm going to go for things where they're like the, the more short term aims so I can mm-hmm. get the, the persona, the higher points for that. And you sort of you try and find a balance where you're trying to you've got some long term goals, but you also constantly got like a flow of like discrete, sort of like smaller goals that you can keep achieving going on. And knowing how to sort of work that and how to tie mm-hmm. into what's going on in the game, it the game rewards you for doing that. Like the last session in your uh, Chronicle of the Crowns game, where I'm like, oh, like a year's passed, my character's been separated from the king. I'm going to make one of my goals like, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to rejoin the king and I'm going to sign on for his crusade against the undead horde. And I'm like, mm-hmm. realistically, by the end of the session, I can pretty much guarantee, unless something horrendous happens, I'm probably mm-hmm. going to have like hooked up with like Matthew's character and we're going to be like crusading against the undead. So I can tick that off and get a persona point. Mm-hmm. But other things like, oh, I'm going to become this like avenging knight, bringing like justice to the helpless and whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to fully achieve that. But. Mm-hmm. I can be working towards it in almost every session and getting like a constant flow of these like fate points going yeah. through. Yeah. And I think this is um, to tie it back to Smoke and Snow. Um, <clears throat> there's um, system mastery in both. Uh, so Smoke yeah. and Snow is, is uh, old school essentials. And um, the, the system mastery, such as it is, because the system <laughs> is, um, is, Sort of very boiled down, as as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, but it's, it's basically BX D and D, isn't it? Yeah, very very sort of compact stuff. So the system mastery then becomes something a little bit different. It shape shifts into 
uh, what <laughs> what um, you might call if you were into the design or RPG game design uh, terminology, you might call it fictional positioning, which is a fancy way of saying if you can have your character be in the the game situation if you have your character be in an advantageous position you get something for that yeah so in in burning wheel that would be advantage dice maybe you can um use some of your other skills to supplement the thing that you're actually doing so if you are let's say you're brawling with this one guy and you're sort of like it's a street fight you're, you're fighting with this guy but you also uh, know about human anatomy yeah yeah yeah, you know where to kick him. You know where to punch him for added effect. So you you point that out. You put your extra die in. You're good. Uh, in old school essentials, what I do is uh, I, I play around with basically the the items that I brought with me yeah. uh, to whatever <laughs> thing that we're doing. Uh, I use my grappling hook a lot for different kinds of things, and I, I pitch it to you, and then we work from there, yeah. which is like in sort of my headspace, we're talking about the same stuff, but it is it is presented differently and um sort of burning wheel mechanizes that to uh, a different degree. Whereas in old school essentials it's it's more bring in as you <clears throat> I think in one of your previous uh podcast episodes you were talking uh, something about uh player and character skills. Yes. Like in, yeah. Yeah and uh, <clears throat> that that's kind of we're in both cases we're talking about player skill but it, it is it manifests differently and you you bring it up differently yes. in the game yeah. which is that's also like a funny realization i'm having now is that like my fictional positioning arguing for having something in old school essentials games that you run that's me going like well john i have this thing in my pocket uh i <laughs> it does this can i can i use this yeah. on the problem <laughs> Does it help with the problem? Yeah, I mean, um, I, th- I think as well, if you if you sort of boil it down to its most basics in old school essentials, you, you your system mastery is pretty much going like, what what character class am I playing? Mm-hmm. What's that character class good at? Mm-hmm. And obviously, like originally, like back in the days when there was only like three classes in like D anD D, it was it was like this car- this class does this, this class does this, this class does this. We're in dungeons. That's what that's what happens. But that's become a bit not diluted, but it's become a bit less the case as like more classes have come out and stuff like that. But still, as you were saying earlier, when you were talking about your character Weimar, when you're like, okay, I'm a fighter. I've got I've got a reasonable amount of hit points. I've got armor, which makes me harder to hit. I've got a shield. I've got a magic sword. Right, and the other guy, like with me, is wearing like a shirt and breeches, and he's got a crossbow, and he's got less hit mm-hmm. points. So I need to make sure I'm stood in front of that dude, so he can get his crossbow shots off and weaken the enemy as approaches me. Then I can like go in for like the killing blows and tie them up so they can't get to the weaker guys behind me. And knowing what your class is good at, as well as all these like improvisational mm-hmm. things, sort of like you get rewarded for that in the game by not necessarily in the case of like Arthur points, like systemically, like you get in Burning Wheel, mm-hmm. but you get rewarded by the fact that if you go into a combat and you're the you're the warrior or the fighter, you're more likely to survive that intact than if like the if the thief wades in with like a a short sword or whatever and tries to like batter them down. But as we saw in the last Smoke and Snow, the the thief came into his own where like Dave's like, all right, the, we're in this. Uh, underground like tomb there's loads of traps and treasure chests with like traps and locks on them and there's loads of doors with locks and he's like picking locks all over the place and opening doors he's like running about he's doing like his sniping and like working out his positioning and stuff like that and he's like right okay what what, what are the strength i mean i'm assuming this is how dave works obviously i've known him for a while mm-hmm. he's like all right okay what are the strengths of my class right i'm really fast moving i've got a really good deck so i'm really good at shooting with my bow i've also got these additional skills that I can use to sort of remove a few obstacles that are in our way. And if you lean into that, obviously the game rewards you by like you progressing and surviving through the various encounters. Yeah. And to con- contrast further on this very topic, uh, it's kind of 
like I get rewarded in our OSC stuff, kind of regardless of what happens, because I I enjoy the uh, yeah. the defeats that we have uh, as well, and the character deaths. Like that's all I enjoy all of that. Okay. And, um, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say that I enjoy that. I also like when we succeed, and in Burning Wheel, you can also get rewarded regardless of you know success yeah. in many different ways <laughs> you can get rewarded and uh, burning will sort of thrives on you uh like basically picking up problems <laughs> in a yeah. in a bit like you get in fate when you you've got your aspects and they bring you trouble yeah. um uh, burning wheel also you know is is geared towards bringing trouble to you when you do stuff and when that happens you get more opportunities to just get more rewards from stuff um your skills attributes increase you get these fate points and whatnot um you make new friends uh you make new enemies in burning wheel uh it's just to highlight the the idea of uh sort of i guess player skill as as well as like system mastery in burning wheel you pay points uh, you can purchase at the start of your your character creation you can buy uh, let's say uh, like you buy something called like savvy which maybe yeah. that helps you roll for uh, maybe like negotiating like haggling basically like you're 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 really good at haggling prices and you're paying points for that sort of thing you also, if let's say you're a leper, uh, mm-hmm. like you, you pick that life path, a leper, and um, maybe you have uh, a, a trait from there uh, called, I don't know, diseased or something, which yeah. is that straight up, you know, a negative to that character's life. Yeah. They, it's, it's in nowhere comparable to being a good haggler to being, you know, having a, a terrible disease <laughs> racking your body. Uh, with with like actual effects. Say what, man? That, that, that's what I should have prayed for in last session. Be like, cure me of my disease. Yeah, and which Secret is which is flame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is something we we can do now because you uh you have the flame. Uh, but uh, what I'm uh, driving at it is in Burning Wheel, it doesn't matter if your thing that you're buying is is like pure bonuses or just pure awfulness as far as the character's view, yeah. viewpoint yeah, is yeah. You know, like it doesn't matter which one it is you can hit on that and you can get rewards for yeah. both your character and yourself as a player uh through the things that you do and the more system mastery you have the more you can get for you and your character well, through it, everything it's like an example of of experience personally in your uh, chronicle of the crowns game is like before my character sort of like found this new faith, he had that like a uh, unbeliever trait or whatever it mm-hmm. was, and I sort of leaned into that quite a like lot. Anytime anyone mentioned gods, I'd be like, "That's because they don't exist. That that's <laughs> why you're having trouble with your gods because they're not real. They're made up." <laughs> and like that 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 could have potentially made things quite tricky for us in like a number of social situations. Mm-hmm. But by role playing out that trait, the system rewards you for doing it, whether. Whether people just go, oh, he's, he's on about gods again. It doesn't really cause any problems, or if it causes you problems in a scene by role playing it out, you're still effectively getting rewarded, yeah. regardless of the consequences. Yeah, and and the the thing is, like including those bits in the game is is the the point of it all. So, and you only buy things that you intend to. <laughs> like that's that's the sort of magic in in the Burning Wheel character creation process, I guess, that everything that ends up on your sheet is the important bits in the game. Yep. Um, so, for example, the um, uh, the game has uh, something that's called a character trait, which is basically a descriptor uh, and just a descriptor. So it could be something like you're uh, arrogant or you're hairy. So... If you have the hairy trait, that's not like oh, I my like beard grows back. I have the five o'clock shade like every yeah. day, even if I shave daily. Uh, it's not that you are the hairiest, like you are <laughs> Mister Hair, and um, that is sort of like the um, the point of it all. If you buy that trait for yourself, hairy, 
uh, then you are, for both yourself and everyone else in the game, you're underlining that I want this to be a part of the game. I yeah. will bring this up. And this is something that we're going to play with. I am the hairiest. So when you go into, I don't know, the, um, the, I forget the, the particular breed of those, those cats that don't really have oh, <laughs> a yeah, lot yeah. of fur going, but you go into the, the hairless cat kingdom and, um, and you are the hairiest. They might just be like, you need to be burned at the stake because you are the devil yeah. <laughs> and uh and like stuff like that. it doesn't need to be that dramatic but the point is like you put something on your sheet you bring that up invoke drama cause trouble and engage with all that stuff and good things happen you get rewarded yeah. and and it's both in the good and the bad sort of ostensibly good and the um uh, uh very 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 like negative stuff yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the one of the sort of favourites of games I've played in is um, some uh, one of the guys off the, um, the the sort of audio dungeon Discord. I mean, ran um, Barrow Maze using um, a, a retro clone called Delving Deeper, and that's like literally a clone of like the original like three little brown books, where mm-hmm. there's only like three classes and like there's an optional thief class. But one of the things I enjoyed in that is like every weapon, regardless of what it is. Does like d6 hit points damage mm. that's it there's no like special shizzle it's all mm-hmm. just d6 damage and like, i really enjoyed that because like, as soon as i got into the game i was like oh well if it doesn't matter what weapon i wield because it mm-hmm. was just d6 damage that means i can wield anything as a weapon and mm-hmm. do d6 damage to the point where at one point uh some guy like picked i mean colin still ribs me about this now but some guy like picked my dwarf's pocket and i was like oh i'm gonna I'm just gonna rip a chair leg off this stool I'm sat on in the tavern, and I'm just gonna like, throw mm-hmm. it at him as he runs away. I was like, oh, I'm gonna try and like tangle his legs up, and like mm-hmm. then I can run, stump my way across with my slow movement and like catch him and get my money back. And uh, I succeeded in the roll and got like max like six damage and just like tonk <laughs> tonk this guy in the head and like killed him with like a <laughs> chair leg. And like every time we played after that, like Colin's like, oh, I don't even go near any chairs. <laughs> um, that that was a bit where like because the because the system was like so like generic in that again in a way it was almost sort of it didn't really reward the system mastery in a system way but it was quite mm-hmm. sort of freeing in terms of like oh well if if everything just does d6 damage like it doesn't matter what I, I use i can pick up like a like a milk pail and like hit someone with it and it's d6 damage or i can grab a chair and like hit someone with it it's d6 damage or i can pick up a sword or a fire poker it's d6 damage and i really love that yeah, it, it evokes in me um, memories of uh, a bunch of movies where you have a scene where there is two very capable combatants that are in an environment that is rich in like things you could pick up and use. Would, would um, you say like, they're maybe under siege in that environment? <laughs> yeah. And it's like a kitchen. Yeah. Like if you have a movie and you have a fight in the kitchen, they're going to use everything in the kitchen yeah. like the pans the knives there's going to be vegetables past the hot soup always a classic yeah i mean uh, i think i think that's <laughs> potentially a downside towards having in that this specific situation i mean the slightly mm-hmm. more detailed mechanics because yeah i mean like for myself I, I, I wouldn't really give a shit if i was like oh if i wield this like this soup terrine it's gonna like do less damage mm-hmm. or whatever i just fucking go for it but like i could see people who are very sort of system motivated mm-hmm. being like oh well i could i could like get all funky and like improv and just grabbing stuff but like, if i wield this soup terrine i'm only doing like d4 damage whereas if i just like unsheathe my broadsword i can probably like finish him in one whereas mm-hmm. like say in the sort of slightly simpler system like delving deeper it's like it doesn't have that because you're like oh it doesn't matter what i pick up here i just go crazy and like grab anything and it's d6 mm-hmm. it's great but by the same token, you also don't get any sort of distinction between the weapons. Mm-hmm. It's not like you know, like, um, you're playing like OSC and you're like, oh, okay, I'm I'm wielding this like two-handed like broadsword. It does like much more damage, but I'm going last in every round because it's so heavy to swing. And then you get something like where you found like your gauntlets of ogre power, and you're like, mm-hmm. I can wield like a double-handed sword in like one hand. Okay, mm-hmm. great, let's go. Mm-hmm. So I, I, again, I think upsides and downsides to like more specific systems yeah. and more generic systems it's just w- yeah. what happens to work for your particular flavor doesn't it yeah yeah and also like recognizing what that works for is 
is good. So if if you're using like yeah, when you're attacking, you do one d six damage, but you need something to like you, not necessarily with fists, but you need something to hit with. Yeah. Use as a weapon, one d six damage. You're good. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, that like sounds very much like that's going to be a, like a pulp adventure type deal, uh, high adventure, um, sort of like high risk scenarios. Yep. Uh, and a lot of like improbable heroics uh, and, and all, all of that is invoked just by the fact that you have the freedom to engage with objects basically at your leisure when it comes to that sort of thing. So like recognizing that that's at least to me, that would be the strength of, of this thing. Um, I would then proceed to have the game be like that uh, and and maybe like... For, well, clearly, I'm I'm not saying I would run a, a, a like a old school room by room dungeon crawl with this. Yeah. It wouldn't be that because uh, I I my instinct says this is more like Indiana Jones, <laughs> and we're we're gonna we're gonna improv our way through some very very dangerous stuff, and we're gonna have like high adventure. <laughs> okay, so I think to to wrap this up because I've been talking for nearly like yeah. three hours and thank you very much for that although <laughs> i think to be honest given the amount we talk about burning wheel like luke crane should be like sponsoring us he, he's not by the way anyone listening <laughs> yeah yeah but no, um, not at all. uh i think to, to close off i'm just going to sort of ask the ask you a question i'm I'll probably going to answer it myself mm. afterwards in terms of well, we've talked a lot about sort of long-running campaigns and the current status of our campaigns where do you see your Burning Wheel, Chronicle of the Crowns campaign going in the the future? And are there any particular bits that obviously that you can reveal because I don't want you to spoil mm-hmm. anything because I'm playing in it, mm-hmm. but any particular bits that you're like really looking forward to? I'm really looking forward to us um, ending up in a... Well, now we're, we're sort of at the situation where the ram has touched the wall and we're actually going to get into basically uh into full scale conflict with a a bad guy that has been uh pointed out at the very start of the game like some 30 sessions ago we sort of learned about the existence of this bad guy and we've been doing a lot of like background uh, groundwork stuff for this now we we didn't get anywhere near where we i suppose wanted to be at this point yeah so uh, in true burning wheel fashion um we're, we're kind of uh we're bleeding a bit we're we're stumbling a bit but we're we're going ahead we're doing the thing and uh getting engaged with that like big conflict that has been brewing up in the horizon for uh, for a bit uh is something i'm really looking forward to and specifically the conclusion of that when we finally engage with the uh, uh what's called the last king yep. the, the this this aforementioned uh, undead uh, pretender pretender king um, like engaging with the last king whether that's like uh, personal combat like I've been thinking about like are we going to have like a duel uh, or or is it going to be a, maybe it's going to be like a big social conflict depending on how things go uh, both things are, are possible uh, maybe it's just going to be a massive war that we end mm-hmm. up doing but any one of these things I'm, I'm really looking forward to. And this is what I think is going to happen in the immediate future. We're going to get in some big time, um, light versus dark, uh, big yeah. fights, grand war, um, like big bad guys on the field, hopefully big good guys on the field, uh, making some really like set piece events happen. Uh, uh, I've got to say with, with regards to that, I mean, obviously I- I'm looking forward to like the big battle bits and play like a fighter effectively, mm. like a sort of combat and like those are my main skills. But also the way the sort of like bad guys are like been set up, the way he's been like consistently portrayed throughout mm-hmm. this, and obviously the, the the sort of undead king and obviously the, the greater darkness like lurking behind him. Like I am fully like we're not just going to ride up and like tonk him with a load of swords, yeah, and a- that's going to be him <laughs> done. Because I'm like the way he's been set up, and obviously I know we're going for like the talking, but mm-hmm. I'm envisioning like you know you see the bit at the start where like um, Sauron like comes out with his big mace, and mm-hmm. he's just like one swing of it, and like twenty men are like, ah! 
that and that flying yeah. through the air. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, oh, if we just like charge towards him with our men, like something like that's going to happen and we're just going to get mm-hmm. leveled. So yeah. uh, the, the bit I'm really looking forward to, as well as like the, the sort of combat bits and maybe trying out the mm-hmm. fight or the debate mm-hmm. rules, as well as that, I'm looking forward to the bit where we inevitably like go like, oh, we can't just like, we can't just shank yeah. him with a load of swords and we're going to have to work again like facing complications and burning wheel we're going to have to like work out like some sort of strategy to try and deal with him whether that's just like oh king cameron's gonna like finally bust out his sorcery and like summon some like mighty creature to like battle him or whether like the, the adherents of the secret flame are going to like do some like massive like prayer mm-hmm. and summon a miracle or whatever w- whatever it turns out to be i'm looking forward to that moment where we're like we all of us have to go like right this swords, is it swords aren't cutting it this is it like what are we gonna do mm-hmm. the, the, those are the bits i sort of really like in burning will and in particular the chronicle of the crowns campaign yeah where, but, where you're sort of like right the first plan is done it has not worked what yeah. now and yeah and, and now we need to pull a rabbit out of a hat yeah. real quick <laughs> yeah and it was, it was, it was um, exciting it was why i enjoyed that whole encounter with like the the um the beast i'm sorry i forget the name of it yeah the, the girion girion yeah, yeah. Where, where it's like oh um, with me as like the npc like sir regress was all very noble and like faithful and like, loyal to his men and whatever and um we've got the point where like matthew's like oh yeah may- maybe if we could like release this creature we could use him as like a living weapon but like the creature itself's so, like oh, i've been unjustly punished I just want an end to it all. And like as as it grass, I'm like, oh, you know, we should, it's been punished enough, we should give it like an honourable death. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that like, because I'm an NPC, I'm not going to make that decision. Mm-hmm. But uh, I love the fact that like Matthew had to like make that decision. Where ostensibly, there's no right answer. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. You know, like, yeah, he probably would have been useful in like the final battle if we could have somehow used him. Mm-hmm. But he, as I said at the time, he's having to weigh up that like, oh, what, what do I want as being the most useful thing for me? versus like this poor like misbegotten creature who's been like chained mm-hmm. up for like most of eternity yeah, an eternity <laughs> yeah exactly in a, yeah. In a dungeon <laughs> and it, again not in the same way as like the oh we've got to work out like a, a plan in a life and death situation mm-hmm. but again it's a case of like oh we're in this situation where we can't just like brute force our way through it there's mm-hmm. no like right or wrong answer really but yeah. i've still got to make an important decision which yeah. those are the bits i'm really loving about the campaign yeah, I I really uh, I realized it sometime into thinking about how that might go and setting that whole thing up for uh, 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 for that particular scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was I was really at the end. I realized I'm I'm doing my own Kobayashi Maru thing <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. Like this this is it, it, this is entirely the same kind of test of character. It's yeah. it's, it's not um something you can math out at all <laughs> yeah it's it, like i say it's, it's not there's a right or a wrong answer it's just like what path do you take and what does mm-hmm. that say about you yeah yeah that was really really fun to yeah, do i really yeah. enjoyed that i mean in terms of um in terms of smoke and snow without giving too much away i think eventually you guys are going to locate the night blade then mm-hmm. it's going to become like oh what and I, again, I won't go into too many details. I don't mm-hmm. want to ruin it. But then it's going to become like, all right, what? Say you guys recover it. What do you guys do now? You've got these three god blades, mm-hmm. you know. And then potentially we'll sort of like be in like the end game of this particular campaign once mm-hmm. we get to that stage, which could could happen relatively quickly, depending on how mm-hmm. quickly you guys find it and yep. what you decide to do with it. Could take a bit longer. It just depends on what goes on. And like I say. If it happens quickly, I'll probably like run another game of some kind in this same campaign world, though not yeah. necessarily in the same time period. But I'm looking forward to that bit again. Like I said, making decisions like I was talking about your campaign. Mm-hmm. I'm looking for that bit where you guys have like. I'm almost looking forward to the bit when you've got the God Blades as much as like you trying to get them. Yeah, get, when, get when you've there, got yeah. all three of them, and you're like, "Great guys, we've we've done it. We've we've, yeah. we've got the Night Blade. We've got the the Green Blade. We've got the Sun Blade." Right, we've got enough people of all the different alignments to us that like, so one of us can hold each of these blades. Mm-hmm. Now what? And to answer that, uh, which I think we've uh, touched on very lightly, yeah. um, um, I seem to recall that I was talking about that some in some session, um, that uh, I certainly got the idea that it, it might be on the table that if we get all the swords... Like my understanding is that there might have been a singular deity that was 
sort of sectioned into pieces from which the swords were made of, or maybe the pieces were put into the swords. And I think we we might have a vested interest when we get the swords of of brewing up this plan of how do we how do we rejoin the blades, perhaps rejoin yeah. this essence that is in these swords, because maybe the essence was one at some point in the distant past before they did all this, the ancient you know, wizard lords as they were. Um, so like I, I too am seeing something like that um, happening, um, like getting the sword, because uh, we're explicitly pursuing the Nightblade now. We yeah. have the two already. And I think we we definitely do want to do something uh, maybe a little bit crazy <laughs> when, <laughs> when we get them, because that's been our thing. And I think like some characters, like they have religious motivations. Like if we can take these swords, maybe melt them down, however it works. But if we can, you know, quote unquote, release one of the old gods, that that might just be the thing that we decide to do. Uh, yeah. I, I try to do anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm also seeing like we, we're gonna go in, we're gonna get the sword, we're gonna concoct something. Uh, <laughs> very dangerous to do uh with the three swords and and we're gonna see where that goes i guess which is i guess you know we're extending the scope in some direction that we haven't really gone into because our game hasn't included a lot of magically capable no. player characters so we've we we haven't had that aspect a lot like yeah, I mean, the no. sort of cosmic the the, know, the only weirdness. the only sort of magic users we really had was uh, when darren was playing brother lomas's friar who mm-hmm. had like some like healing magics, and that's pretty much been it. We've had like no wizards or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to finding out, I guess, what kind of weirdness we can create when we have all the the god blades, as they are called. Excellent. So that concludes my conversation with Johannes about long form campaigns, and obviously we segued into some other stuff, and we discussed our own campaigns a little bit. It only remains for me to say thanks to Johannes for joining me and agreeing to be part of these episodes, and thanks to anyone who's listened to them. If you've listened to them, we hope you've enjoyed them. If you've got anything you want to say about them, you can get in touch a number of different ways. Or maybe you want to just tell us about your own long-form running campaigns or your experiences with longer campaigns. You can leave us a voicemail message on SpeakPipe or Anchor. There'll be a link in the description of this episode. Or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we see you again, take care, stay safe, and whatever you're playing, have fun. Have fun.